talking about delivering healthcare um, outside the UK, so it seems a good opportunity to share my experience of working with Medicines and Pontier, uh, Doctors Without Borders, over in Uganda towards the end of the Civil War. Um, I was there in 2004, 2005. And it struck me actually when I was preparing the talk just how um, similar the challenges um, of delivering healthcare are very similar wherever you are in the world, whether you're in Africa, whether you're in Asia, whether you're in London, in the UK, in the NHS. A lot of the challenges that we face in delivering a good healthcare service are actually quite similar. And uh, so, see if you can uh, just spot the similarities as, as we go through. So, um, here's Uganda on the equator in Southeast Africa, and that's where we were based working in Lira district, which is in the northern part of the country, with Lira town at the bottom um, of the region and stretching up to the Sudan border in the north there. And since 1986, there'd been a civil war um, throughout the whole of the north region, which was due to the Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA, led by Joseph Coney, terrorizing the, the area, um, lead, which led to the villages being burned indiscriminate maiming and killing, raping of the women, kidnapping of the children, um, and just a horrible, horrible place to be. Um, so the government decided to move the population from their healthy homesteads um, into fairly crowded camps of between 20 and 30,000 people in each camp. Um, about 80% of the population in the north were living like this, and that um, was 1.6 million. So um, MSF knew that this was going on, sent a team out to assess the severity of the situation. Um, and looking at the statistics in about six different camps, realised that the crude mortality ratio and the under five mortality, ratio, uh, mortality rate um, was well above emergency levels. And unfortunately, at the same time as moving into these very unhealthy conditions, the healthcare system there collapsed. Um, the healthcare workers had weren't being paid, they had no um, safety guarantee, they had nowhere to stay, so of course they left. Um, and even if they had stayed, the rupture of drug supplies meant that there's nothing to treat people with anyway. So the water situation was pretty dire as well. Um, the nationally recognised need for water each day requirement for water is um, 20, 15 to 20 litres per person per day. On average in the camps, each person had 1.7 litres. So MSF, as well as providing medical care, does um, do what's our engineering, and we managed to increase it to five litres per day, but it was still not, not really enough. So having done the assessment, we decided that our presence there was justified, and um, so we, we decided what are our objectives, you have to have a focus. We decided to focus on basic health care for the under fives, being the most vulnerable part of the population. And then later on extended that to adults with antenatal care and, and other things. I'll go through the other um, aims of our project um, as I go through the talk. But at the bottom there you've got advocacy, and that's a really important part of the work underlying everything. Um, on a local level, really having a good dialogue with the Ministry of Health and other actors, trying to get them involved and get the, the, the Ministry of Health clinics open again so that we could leave. Um, but also on an international level, trying to draw attention to what was going on um, in northern Uganda. We had journalists visiting, we gave interviews on the World Service. So really trying to spread the word um, as well. So how did we do this? Well, we had a great team. We had 13 expatriates from about nine different countries and 300 national staff, broadly divided into medics and logisticians. And here we've got um, the chief logisticians, uh, Bonnie from Uganda and Don from Canada, um, based in the Lira office. And the logisticians really kept the whole uh, machine working, uh, maintaining the vehicles, making sure that we got the drugs up from Kampala. Um, sourcing uh, building supplies and, and building the structures that we required. And these guys really, really kept things moving. You might think that maybe administration isn't quite so important um, when you're working in fairly basic conditions in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but in fact, it's incredibly important. You have 300 local workers, um, they all need job contracts, they all need uh, medical insurance, they all need um, job descriptions, 
and everything has to be done according to national law and international law, so it's all got to be done carefully and above board. So we had um, Asha here from Canada, who was heading the admin team, who were crucial. The medics were divided into pairs. We worked one doctor and one nurse, covering two camp clinics each. Um, and we would go out to the camps during the week and live there, um, and so that we could really see what was going on on the ground and make sure that the service was running properly. And then at the weekend, we'd go back to Lira Town, um, talk about statistics, do our um, data collections, have meetings, and it goes without saying that wherever you're trying to develop a healthcare system, you're very dependent on the infrastructure. Uh, whether you're in London or whether you're out there in the African bush, during the rainy, during the dry season, it was fine. Infrastructure wasn't bad. Roads were quite good. Grass was low. Risk of ambush was low. In the rainy season, it was a different story. Um, if you're driving along a quagmire, the grass was high the risk of ambush from the rebels was high and we were very dependent on good radio contact um, with our base to communicate our location frequently and depending on them for the news of, of any rebel activity in the area and that, that affected patient um, tra transport and delivery of drugs so we had to keep bear that in mind when you're um, organising your pharmacy supplies. So initially we had mobile clinics going out and back the same day because the security wasn't very good. But as soon as possible we established fixed clinics. And this was at Gwen Clinic as I first knew it. We used a school building, uh, which was very generously led to us by the school. It worked really well and then they decided they wanted the building back. So uh, we ended up building a new clinic just behind it. And that was really interesting as a doctor to have the opportunity to help design the clinic and, and decide how you want the rooms to be, how you want the patient flow to be. Um, and uh, for me, that was a really important, interesting part of the, of the job with MSF. You're not just a clinician, you're involved in the decisions about buildings, in the pharmacy supply, in, in the whole structure of the project. So it was, that, was, that was really exciting for me. So how does the clinic work? Once it's established, well this is our waiting area under the mango tree. You use what resources you have. Um, and we used our local resources as well in the camps. Lots of people there, well educated, needed a job, um, and we recruited quite a few people from the camps. This is Thomas who's doing the weighing and measuring so that children were screened for malnutrition. And also if we know their weight, we know the right drug dose to give. These data were written down onto their health registration cards, kept here by Jasper and Eric. And of course, uh, that was with their name and their address, their block number, so that we, uh, they were traceable and we had data um, about what was going on. From there, um, consulting happened in a private area in the clinic thing, and we used um, nationally qualified nurses and midwives, who uh, many of them had come up from Kampala to work with us. We have Agnes was actually training Maureen here. Maureen is a midwife who just joined us. So they do a basic history and examination and then decide whether treatment was necessary or whether further investigations are necessary. We didn't have much in the way of investigations. We did establish a couple of labs later on. The most important thing uh, were um, rapid diagnostic tests. tests. These are really useful in the field as long as they're um, properly chosen for their um, sensitivity and specificity. Um, so if a child comes in with fever, is it malaria, is it not? You need to know so you can give them the right treatment. And these parachecks were fantastic. Put a drop of blood on one end, put some buffer on, carries the blood along. One, one line is uh, negative, two lines are positive. That's your malaria, you know to treat it. If not, you look for something else. Unfortunately, the treatment for malaria um, tasted revolting. Um, <laughs> Artemis and der derivatives, which are really the only effective uh, treatment for falciparum malaria. Unfortunately, the Ugandan guidelines at the time were still using chloroquine, um, which was useless. Um, I think they have changed now. Um, but it was difficult. There was a lot of um, apprehension from the, from the patients about whether this new drug was, was effective, especially as it tasted so horrible. Even drinking chocolate, which we mixed it with at times, didn't work. But, um, apart from the malaria treatment, um, we had a fairly broad but basic um, range of pharmaceuticals available. You have to decide where, what you're going to do with your resources. You can't treat everyone for everything. So we focused on the main problems, which were malaria, respiratory disease, skin disease, and we had ketamine available for some minor surgical operations that we did as well. And this was Joseph, 
who was a great storekeeper and kept some very tight books. Joseph worked with Mary, funnily enough, in the pharmacy, and this was Mary's um, son, Nicholas, who was modelling not one, not two, but three of our burn cures. Again, wherever you are in the world, there are always people who want every treatment available. But um, Nicholas was an amazing little boy, um, and I'm telling you about him because he was dropped in a fire um, by his brother. His brother was six when he was abducted by the LRA, and for three years he was a child soldier. He came back at the age of nine and was doing really well, um, until one day something just switched and he decided to put Nicholas in a fire. Um, so he sustained these horrible burns, but he actually made a remarkable recovery. Um, but I wonder what's happened to his brother, whether he'll recover. Um, we tried to address some of this with having a mental health program, uh, where we tried to help children who've been abducted to express some of their feelings and their experiences. There was um, also a lot of sex and gender-based violence going on in the camps um, due to the situation there, and uh, this program was to try and, and help the victims of that as well. Another part of the um, any healthcare system is surveillance. What's going on on the ground? We had some really good, t um, a really good team of outreach workers who were living in the camps, who would talk to people, gather data, find out if there were rumours that we needed to know about, um, and really great link between our, our, our little clinic and, and the, the rest of the camp. Um, and also it worked the other way. They disseminated health information. They publicised vaccination campaigns, they, they try to teach people about the malaria treatments and about um, using condoms and the usual sort of health messages. And again, you need that to be able to evaluate whether what you're doing is working and if not, change it. Teaching and training, wherever you are, integral part of um, the work and it was a mutual skills exchange. I learned loads while I was there and I tried to teach my team as well. And uh, here they're teaching each other about diseases with potential, uh, with outbreak potential. Um, that was part of our emergency preparedness. Um, unfortunately, that also included preparedness for major incidents, which out here were out there weren't um, tube bombs, but um, fire. And this here, the camp, two thirds of the camp burnt down in front of our eyes in 45 minutes at the end of one day, and miraculously, only two people were seriously hurt. But you have to be prepared for. Disease prevention is important. Um, we launched a measles vaccination campaign when the measles uh, statistics were starting to go up, measles numbers were climbing, um, and we knew that the Ministry of Health campaign hadn't covered the crucial 80% that you need for herd immunity. So we launched our own campaign. Uh, that's um, Sarah giving it um, vitamin A drops to try to combat the uh, blindness that can come with measles. And finally, nutrition. There was a lot of um, uh, malnutrition in the camps, despite the fact that the, the World Health, uh, the World Food Programme delivered um, supplements every three months. So we established a supplementary feeding centre and a therapeutic feeding centre, which was actually down in Lyra. And the most severely uh, malnourished children were taken down to the therapeutic feeding centre where they stayed for a few weeks. And I'll just finish by telling you about Ronald, who was one of our success stories from the feeding centre, where I worked for the last six months I was there. He arrived like this, looking like an old man. He was only 11, grey hair, was 54% of the weight he should be for his height. Um, he was barely able to stand, um, and he also had malaria. So we treated malaria, not a lot happened. We looked a bit more extensively and found that he had schistosomiasis, which is easily treatable. And as soon as we treated that, I hope you can see the line, it started to climb very nicely and he reached a, a healthy weight within about four weeks. And he left with a twinkle in his eye and some chubby cheeks, which was great to see. And for me, um, children like Ronald really make it worth trying to strive to overcome the challenges that you always face when you're trying to deliver decent health care. Um, yes, it boils down to politics a lot of the time. Yes, there are lots of questions about whether or not you should actually be there in situations like this. Are non-governmental <coughs> organisations making the problem worse? Very difficult, lots of questions, and a lot, lot of them are very valid. But um, I do believe that um, everybody does have a right to basic health care wherever they are in the world. And the local language there was Luo and Apoyomatek means thank you very much. Mm -hmm. thank you.